Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce to you uh, Dr. Carl Schneiderman. Uh, I first uh, read about Carl when I just entered the field of otolaryngology uh, in the beginning of uh, 2000. Uh, at that time, every paper which I looked uh, in the field of uh, uh, skull base surgery, I always encountered the name Carl Schneiderman. Uh, this is because this group in Pittsburgh and Carl, uh, along with other very famous names as Lilligam Shaker, Ivo Janica, that our maxillofacial surgeon know, uh, Eugene Myers, that we all know of in laryngology, uh, they were experimenting uh, new avenues in surgery, and back then it was uh, open skull base surgery, anterior skull base surgery. And uh, I remember uh, this time we were very surprised that Carl and his group decided to look and change their very successful at that time uh, treatment and pathway and explore things that was not acceptable and unknown, endoscopic sinus surgery. And I remember when I first came to the North American skull base meeting, and those of you who went there remember, this was very unpopular and very, uh, and, and, and a lot of the big names in skull base surgery said very bad things about the people, the group in Pittsburgh, and their use of skull base surgery, and endoscopic skull base surgery, which was, we all know, used for sinusitis and inflammatory diseases, also to take tumors. The first were benign tumors, such as pituitary, and then they presented their data in uh, malignant tumors. And many of the, the people in this group said, oh, this is heresy. You shouldn't do that. And you damage the patients, etc." cetera. And, and in a series of paper during the beginning of the 2000, uh, they changed medicine. And they changed medicine in a way that everybody is practicing endoscopic surgery now for malignant and benign tumors. And those who are not applicable for endoscopic surgery will go to other approaches. And this is a great chance when I went to, to Pittsburgh for, for a short time for a fellowship. It was a great time to see uh, the, this person and these guys who really changed medicine, the way uh, oncology is being done now. So it's really a pleasure. I think it's your first visit in Israel and the first talk in Israel. Please, Dr. Snyderman. Uh, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I may be ex extending my trip based on the results of this election, but <laughs> so I may be posting a job application uh, on tomorrow's presentations. We'll see. Uh, hopefully, this will. But Dr. Gill is, uh, is correct. You know, I've been around a long time, and I've been uh, uh, fortunate to be part of two major paradigm shifts in skull, ba say, skull base surgery. And the first with Shaker and Jonica really doing big open skull base surgeries when no one else was doing them, and then really being part of that the adoption of endoscopic technology and applying that to skull base problems. And uh, you know, it's like any th any good thing. It's always met with resistance at first, and you have to fight those battles. You have to have the uh, conviction of your vision, um, and uh, if you believe in it, just keep working, working at it. But um, um, you know, you always go through phases of innovation. You know, the first phase really is in, in showing that uh, the feasibility uh, of of a new uh, endeavor, uh, that it can be done, that you you have the right technical uh, tools and skills that it can be done safely, and then you start uh, um, looking at the outcomes. And so we're at that phase now where we can really look critically at our oncologic outcomes and really start to say whether this is better or, or equivalent to uh, what's been done in the past. All right, hallelujah. Um, so what I'd like to talk, to, talk about really is uh, sort of an overall management uh, strategy for sinonasal malignancy and we're going to divide it into different types of, of, uh, of tumors. And you know, going to focus a little bit, on, a lot on the, the surgical techniques. Just like to really understand my audience, though, how many of you are head and neck surgeons? How many neurosurgeons out there? How many radiation oncologists? 
How many medical oncologists? <laughs> okay. And there must be some others out there that I haven't named. I apologize. Um, before I'd like to I do that, I'd like to introduce a friend of mine, Bill Strickland, here uh, with Mr. Perez. And uh, he has um, founded a, a training center for impoverished youth in Pittsburgh. And it really has become a global model for uh, helping kids get off the streets, teaching them real job skills to keep them out of trouble. And the uh, uh, first international center is uh, opening in Akko. Uh, in one or two weeks. So I encourage you to go to the uh, opening ceremony if you can. And I, I think it really is a model that changes people's lives and, uh, and uh, it's a phenomenal work that he and others are doing around the world. Um, I have no uh, disclosures uh, that are relevant to this presentation. So let's first talk about preoperative assessment of patients. You know, what do you do when you see a patient like this? You've got a big tumor filling up the nasal cavity. You know, what are the things that you, that you want to know? Are you going to go in there and do a skull base uh, surgery uh, right away? So, you know, not everything in the nose is an olfactory neuroblastoma. It's one of our favorite tumors, but uh, there are lots of other things that occur there too. So you do your biopsy and you get, maybe get a frozen section and the OR comes back as small blue cells. Well, what do you do then? Do you go ahead and take it out or do you wait for the final result? Well, the problem is there are lots of things that look like small blue cells. In this case, we have a plasmacytoma and a melanoma, you know, both with big uh, skull-based tumors. Um, so here are some of the other tumor types, uh, pituitary adenomas, olfactory neuroblastoma, neuroendocrine carcinoma, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinomas, melanomas, and U Ewing sarcoma. So a wide variety of tumors, and I've uh, actually written a little limerick here to help you remember the, the, the different types. Um, so that's one of the major challenges of working in the nose is just the variety of histologies. And these have different biologic behaviors and different management strategies. Um, the olfactory neuroblastoma is really the poster child for skull base surgery uh, because of its location at the skull base. And we have a good understanding of, of what treatments are most effective for this tumor. Um, and so it's an easy one to, to study and use as, a, uh, as a, an example for the management of other skull-based malignancies. So when you uh, try to decide whether to take out a tumor using endoscopic or open techniques, there are a lot of things to consider. It's not just the tumor type. It's not just the location. There are, you have to consider the patient comorbidities, the reconstructive needs. Your own experience is very important. You know, um, um, how long it takes, and, and whether you need early adjunctive therapy. It's important to remember that operability is determined by the biologic behavior of the tumor. It's not determined by the surgical approach. So if I can take something out using an open approach, if it's operable by an open approach, it's very likely operable by an endoscopic approach. So we have to um, be clear about that. And the goals of surgery are the same. You know, we want a complete removal of the tumor with the least morbidity for the patient. So the endoscope is really just a tool that allows us to use the endonasal corridor, and we're trying to choose the best approach for the patient. It's not about using the endoscope. It's about the best approach for the patient. And sometimes that's a combination of approaches, both open and endoscopic. The margins of resection should be the same as an open approach. And uh, just because we have an endoscope, that should not be an excuse to do lesser surgery, to do partial debulking of tumors, to, to violate basic oncological principles. We need to do the same surgery. And so while we're in this learning phase of really establishing the efficacy of endonasal surgery, we may have to err on the side of doing bigger operations until we really know uh, whether it is equivalent. So what is the extent of, of uh, surgery? For a tumor that involves a skull base, uh, we would argue that it's a bilateral resection of the dura and the olfactory tracts. Undoubtedly, there are smaller tumors where you can get by with less, but this should be our default operation. And here are two examples to demonstrate why. So this is, these are olfactory neuroblastomas, and here you can see, if I can find my mouse. So here's the olfactory bulb, and here's uh, a tumor coming through the dura and in that olfactory bulb. This was not apparent on preoperative imaging. And here's another example how we're, we're elevating the dura, and here you can see the tumor invading the bottom of this olfactory bulb. So if I had just taken the bone or just taken the dura, I would have been leaving tumor behind. So if you have an olfactory neuroblastoma, 
uh, that's attached to the skull base, we feel that you should take the olfactory bulb uh, on every patient. What are the contraindications to an endoscopic approach? Well, obviously, if you have a very big tumor with invasion of superficial structures, it's more expedient to do an open approach. If you have involvement of major neural and vascular structures, the goals of surgery have changed, and we're no longer striving for uh, a complete oncological resection. We perhaps should be thinking of best palliation for that patient. What about orbital involvement? Is that a contraindication? Um, and what about brain invasion? Is that a contraindication to endoscopic surgery? Well, here's an example of an undifferentiated carcinoma that has subpeel invasion. And you'll see that with endoscopic techniques, we can do the same kind of dissection that we would do with an open approach. So we're able to do a subpeel dissection, preserving cortical vessels, taking a little cuff of brain tissue if we have to. So brain invasion or orbital invasion by itself is not an absolute contraindication. It really depends on the extent of invasion. And so the, the more brain invasion there is, the greater the proximity to, to cerebral vessels, and, and certainly if there's encasement, then the goals of surgery have changed. Once again, we're not striving for a complete oncological resection, uh, and perhaps we should be considering other treatment modalities first. What are the benefits of endoscopic surgery? I think the major one really is, is improved visualization. I think we're seeing things so much better that uh, we can perhaps achieve better resection margins, uh, understand the margins better. Um, other relative advantages is that we're not violating as much normal tissue to get there, um, and perhaps faster recovery, although I think we end up waiting the same amount of time before we institute postoperative radiation therapy. There appears to be benefit in regards to quality of life. Uh, this is a comparison of our own patient population uh, with similar tumors, uh, cyanonasal malignancies, compared to what was reported by Dr. Gill with open approaches. And so there appears to be some, some uh, advantage for endoscopic approaches. But in many cases, we are trading um, one set of morbidities for a different set. I think one of the most important unanswered questions is what happens to the brain? when you choose an open approach versus an endoscopic approach. And so we've tried to answer this question uh, using meningiomas, uh, uh, olfactory groove meningiomas. And so this was a study we did in, con in conjunction with the University of Toronto. And we matched tumors based on size and amount of, of T2 uh, weighted edema. And we can see that in comparison, uh, bifrontal craniotomy had a lot more brain damage radiographically than endoscopic approaches. Uh, well, we don't know if that translates into neurocognitive function, but you would expect there to be a difference. And so there are ongoing studies trying to answer that question. Um, the nice thing about the endoscope is it really gives us lots of treatment options. Not only are we striving, striving for a complete oncological resection, as you might with this tumor, but we have an option of debulking prior to radiochemotherapy. Well, why would we want to do that? Uh, many times, patients come in with very bulky tumors, uh, their nose is obstructed, it's displacing their eye, they may have a cranial nerve palsy, uh, they may have sinus uh, pain, pressure, bleeding, uh, infection. And so as, a, as part of doing a biopsy, we can debulk most of the tumor, we can take the extradural portion of the tumor out without causing a CSF leak, and then proceed with radiochemotherapy as the primary treatment modality. Um, and uh, other important reasons to do that are, are that it really allows us to assess the extent of the tumor. Uh, tumors that arise in the nasal cavity are often growing into air-filled spaces, pushing against structures without invading them. So if I have a tumor arising from the cribriform that's growing into the sphenoid sinus, it doesn't mean that it's invading all the walls of the sinus. It may be pushed up against the planum or up against the optic canals without invasion of those structures. And so by removing that portion of the tumor, I can change the radiation ports. We can move the radiation away from the brain and the optic chiasm and avoid some of the morbidity associated with those treatments. And there's a theoretical advantage of less tumor, um, le better response to radiation therapy. Um, but that but has not been proven in any clinical trials. Um, the endoscope is really ideal for palliation. Instead of putting someone through a craniotomy to take out part of a tumor, we can go in endoscopically, relieve symptoms with, with minimal mor morbidity for the patient. 
So here's an example of a patient with a massive olfactory neuroblastoma. Uh, clearly, this is not a resectable tumor. The patient's blind in the right eye, and there's cavernous sinus invasion with encasement of the carotid. So, uh, you know, radiochemotherapy is going to be the treatment option, uh, treatment choice here. And so the patient did get um, that as their first treatment, but then we were concerned about progression of tumors to the, to the remaining good eye. We didn't want this place, patient to go blind. So we came in and debulked some of the tumor here just to prevent that progression to the other eye. And these are one-year intervals. You can see the patient still has gross disease, but it's stable post-treatment, and there's been no further progression causing new symptoms for the patient. And then the salvage surgery for patients who have completed radiochemotherapy. Um, that's also a consideration. So if we're faced with, uh, with a, an advanced undifferentiated carcinoma like this that is deemed inoperable, um, if someone has a complete response to uh, chemo RT, are we going to go ahead and do surgery? If they have less than a complete response, uh, certainly we have the option of going in and, and then doing a tumor resection as we see here. So. Um, High-grade tumors, I would favor doing a, uh, um, doing a planned uh, endoscopic cranial-based resection just to give that patient the best chance for long-term cure. So next, I'd like to talk about surgical technique. Um, really, the first step um, with any tumor is really deciding if there's skull base involvement. So here's an example of an elderly uh, patient around 80 years old with a tumor that abuts the skull base. There's no uh, skull base erosion. And so the first thing we have to do is go in and debulk the tumor and really determine whether it's involving the skull base. And so we were lucky in this case. This tumor was not attached to the skull base. It was medial to the middle turbinate, but coming off of the nasal septum. So as you see, as we pull this tumor down, we can see it's free of the skull base. We come across its attachment. And so this is not the traditional on block resection that we were trained to do. Uh, we now take the tumor out in sections, uh, debulking it first. But look at the area of attachment now. It's really a small area on the nasal septum, and now we can do an on-block oncologic resection of the site of attachment. So we do a through and through resection all the way through the septum. We check our mucosal margins, and we have a complete resection without the additional morbidity of, of violating the skull base. And this patient continues to be a long-term survivor. And here we're getting additional margins. And so the, um, this just shows this, the different steps of a cranial base resection now. So as that last case showed, the first step really is debulking tumor that's obstructing your view, really visualizing the sinuses and the skull base margins, really finding the bony walls around the periphery of the tumor, and identifying key landmarks, uh, especially in the sphenoid sinus, such as the optic nerves and the carotid canals and then establish our inferior margin by resecting some of the septum. Uh, anteriorly, we need to take off the floor of the frontal sinus as our margin, so doing a draft three frontal sinusotomy. And we can then follow tumors from the cribriform plate all the way up the posterior wall of the frontal sinus if we have to, but this really defines our anterior margin. And then the drilling off the Cristagalli uh, in the midline establishes our anterior margin on the skull base. And then we work around the periphery, identifying the medial walls of the orbit, uh, the planum, the roof of the sphenoid sinus posteriorly. And then we can also work around the periphery of the tumor to devascularize it. By sacrificing the anterior and posterior arthmoid arteries, we can devascularize the tumor and have less bleeding uh, during tumor removal. And then we, we drill the bone and elevate the bone from the underlying dura around the periphery of the tumor to establish the dural margins, incise the dura, uh, come across the falx anteriorly and across the planum dura and olfactory tracts posteriorly. So here we are making the dural cuts. So this part really becomes an on block resection of the area of skull base invasion. And here you see the olfactory tracts 
uh, being transected posteriorly. And this is the final defect. And so this should look the same as a defect you would get with an open craniofacial resection. Uh, reconstruction uh, can be done uh, using different techniques. Uh, vascularized flaps uh, give the best reconstruction. And the nasal septal flap uh, really has been a workhorse for a number of years now for skull-based reconstruction. It's based on blood supply from the uh, uh, posterior septal branch of the sphenopalatine artery. And here you see a patient uh, one week after surgery with a, a nasal septal flap in place. Here's a final result showing a well-healed flap. And radiographically, you can see it really allows reconstruction of the whole ventral skull base from the frontal sinus to the planum and from orbit to orbit and with acceptable donor site morbidity. So here's an example um, of the skull base defect. The first thing we would, we would do would be to put inlay and perhaps onlay fascial grafts and then transpose the nasal septal flap to cover the defect. The problem with intranasal tumors, however, is many times the nasal septal flap is not available because of tumor involvement or the extent of resection really doesn't give us a big enough flap for reconstruction. And so our favored uh, method of reconstruction is now the extracranial pericranial flap. So this has been the workhorse for many years with open craniofacial resection and using a bicoronal scalp incision, we can elevate a very generous pericranial flap and we can create a window at the level of the nasion. So we are avoiding the additional morbidity of a craniotomy, introducing the flap through that window, and we can do so without any morbidity for the patient. So no loss of sensory or motor function for the scalp. And this really provides us with an unparalleled uh, tissue source for reconstruction. Uh, we do inlay and onlay, uh, fascial grafts first, and now we see us pulling in that pericranial flap. So ample coverage for the whole skull base, we can even use it to reconstruct the periorbita if that's been resected. So putting this all together now, uh, here's a recurrent or residual olfactory neuroblastoma with involvement of the left cribriform. You can see there's sinus surgery has been uh, uh, performed previously on this patient. We start by doing complete uh, sinus surgery on both sides, sphenoethmoidectomies, uh, transecting the nasal septum inferior to the tumor, debulking tumor as necessary, to see the margins, exposing the medial wall of the orbit on the side of the tumor, taking that right up to the plane of the skull base, identifying our anterior and posterior ethmoid arteries so that we can cauterize and transect them, and then opening up the nasal frontal recess uh, in preparation for a draft three frontal sinusotomy. Now we're drilling the skull base circumferentially to expose the dura. On the side of the tumor, we take this all the way out to the junction with the orbit. We can extend it even over the orbit if necessary. And now doing a draft three frontal sinusotomy across the midline. This particular patient had a very, very poorly pneumatized frontal sinus, so you're not really going to see much of a sinus. And then drilling the crista galli in the midline between the cribriform plates. And then we can remove the crista galli along with the, the roof of the ethmoid on both sides and the cribriform plates. And now we have a circumferential view of the dura, and the only area of skull base invasion is right here with the residual tumor. We can extend our margins uh, as needed, now make our lateral dural cuts first so that we can isolate or find the surface vessels uh, on the brain. And now extending our incision across the midline and that brings us to the falx. The crystagalli has already been removed. We can cauterize any veins within the falx and then transect the falx in an anterior to posterior direction. You have to come across it, uh, that free edge of the falx, to release the specimen anteriorly. So there's the last cut. And now the whole dural specimen falls down and it's tethered on the dura and olfactory tracts posteriorly. So we can we could transect those and get additional frozen sections of the margins. And so you can see we have an on block resection of the dural specimen. And we can orient this for the pathologist. We can check margins on the main specimen, but we like to take additional circumferential dural margins all the, all the way around. Uh, just to be sure. So 
So the same control that you would have with an open approach and the same kind of defect that you'd see with an open approach. So you can see a large defect. And now we're doing the extracranial pericranial flap. So bicoronal scalp incision. I, I like to elevate in a subperiosteal plane first and then dissect the flap off of the scalp. So we take this all the way down to the orbital rims and the nasion, really exposing the nasal bones. And just take a drill across there to create a window. And then dissecting uh, the pericranium from the galea. It can be pedicled on one or both sides. Here's the superorbital vessels here to the flap. Got an uh, ample window. Have to make sure your window is big enough that it will not compress the flap. And now looking in through that window, here's our skull base defect. And now coming in through the nose, we do our inlay and onlay fascial grafts. And now we pull the pericranial flap in through that window. And now endoscopically, you can see this flap being pulled through that window. If possible, we try to push the pedicle to one side to maintain a drainage pathway for the frontal sinuses. But if you end up obstructing the sinuses, it's rarely a problem. Uh, but now we have wide coverage with vascularized tissue, and you can see there's really no cosmetic defect for the patient. So that's become our, our, our standard treatment for these large skull base resections. So next I'd like to talk, talk about uh, different uh, treatment strategies for different types of tumors. Uh, once again, uh, olfactory neuroblastomas are really the poster child for skull base malignancy. But when you look back at the literature, there are a lot of problems with, with interpreting the literature. You see many small series uh, that cover long time spans. So obviously techniques, technologies have, have changed over the years, especially with radiation therapy techniques. And uh, probably many of those patients are misdiagnosed. Um, um, mixture of neuroendocrine carcinomas, or SNUCs, and olfactory neuroblastomas. Uh, we continue to use a, a staging system that, that is next to worthless. The KD staging system should not be used anymore. And, uh, and oftentimes, there's no reporting of the Hyams grade or nodal status. Probably the biggest issue, though, is limited follow-up. We know these tumors can come back up to 10 years after surgery. And here's a perfect example. Here's a patient I saw following an open craniofacial resection at nine years follow-up. Um, one year later, you can see a massive recurrence. So these patients need long follow-up for reporting of results. And certainly with the endoscopic uh, experience early on, there's uh, ob an obvious selection bias uh, for earlier stage tumors. So it makes it very difficult to compare and really know if endoscopic surgery works as well. And also, um, I think many surgeons are not doing a complete resection as I've outlined. So I like to take these tumors really and divide them into three categories, sort of good, bad, and ugly, depending upon the um, biologic behavior of the tumors. But in general, uh, if a tumor is resectable, uh, using the, the, the uh, guidelines I talked about here, we would favor endoscopic resection first, followed by radio, radiation therapy plus or minus chemotherapy for higher grade tumors. If it's unresectable, we have the option of extradural debulking, uh, so that we don't delay getting someone into, into therapy, or definitive radiochemotherapy, and we also have the, the possibility of surgical salvage using endoscopic techniques. So next I'd like to sort of run through different tumor types and sort of give you examples and, and just to highlight uh, differences in management. Once again, it all depends on having, having a proper diagnosis. Uh, this is a patient with a lymphoma, so don't rush into surgery without really knowing what you're dealing with. Um, olfactory neuroblastoma, so here we have one that's, that's limited. It goes to the skull base, but there's no radiographic evidence of intracranial or orbital extension. So how, wh what are the margins of resection for this tumor? So hopefully you all, all, gonna say, you're, all of you are saying that we should take the dura and olfactory bulbs in this patient. Well, here's a tumor that's a little bit bigger. This olfactory neuroblastoma has a cystic component that extends intracranially. Um, how aggressive should we be with this tumor? Should this be done open? So how would you treat this tumor? Should it have radiation therapy first? So I think this is still resectable using endoscopic techniques. It turns out that the uh, cystic component, which is quite characteristic of these tumors, there is really no neoplasm on the surface of the brain. Um, 
and we're able to get a good oncologic resection with clear margins. If we look at the literature, we can see uh, some evidence that endoscopic surgery uh, compares favorably to open surgery uh, for, for these tumors. Uh, but the early experience, you know, was done for earlier stage tumors. A more recent analysis of the literature, a systematic review, uh, comparing the two really showed improved survival for endoscopic surgery for all patients and even for advanced tumors or high-grade tumors. And recently, we've started looking at our own experience uh, with endoscopic surgery. We identified 70 patients, of which 51 patients were evaluable. So we excluded patients who had um, uh, non-curative uh, intent or had prior skull-based uh, surgery uh, with, think with uh, recurrence. And uh, you can see that our, we're dealing with a, a very advanced stage group of patients. So we are in, there's not really a selection bias in our own experience. And this is actually more advanced than what's reported in the literature for open approaches. Um, most of the patients are having a complete resection of the layers that we talked about. Only 10% are having neck dissections. Uh, only 6% had needed a conversion to an open approach because of, of positive margins, uh, usually above the orbit. Um, uh, most had reconstruction of the skull base. Um, early on, we were using nasal septal flaps. As I mentioned, most of the patients are now getting extracranial pericranial flaps. Um, based on the surgeon's assessment and pathology results, we were able to get a complete resection in almost 80% of patients, so negative margins. Um, but sometimes that's very hard to determine if you have a true negative margin based on, you know, a close margin. Um, but we couldn't show a difference uh, uh, in, the, in comparing our open and endoscopic uh, uh, approaches. We didn't see a difference in the ability to achieve a complete resection. Morbidity was low. CSF leaks are the most common problem, but only in 10% of, of these patients. And you can see that that's the same as what's reported in the literature for open approaches. Uh, and most importantly, no major other CNS complications. So we're avoiding all those other problems by doing it endoscopically. Recurrences, as expected, are mostly local and regional. Uh, local recurrence is associated with positive dural margins, as you would expect. And survival results with good follow-up of almost uh, five years uh, show that 90% are NED or dead of other causes. So this compares very favorably with the literature, and I think it, at the minimum we've shown equivalence of endoscopic techniques now with, with acceptable follow-up of patients. Well, what about uh, treating patients up front with uh, preoperative radiochemotherapy? Uh, that's uh, long been the standard at the University of Virginia. Um, um, but if you look carefully at the literature, you can see that even though they, they have good survival rates, there's still a, a fairly high uh, local regional recurrent uh, uh, rate. And, and although many of these patients go on to have salvage surgery, um, I, I don't think this makes a strong argument for doing radiochemotherapy first for these tumors. So for olfactory neuroblastomas, endoscopic resection uh, is the treatment of choice uh, when it's resectable. Uh, you may need, you need to be able to switch to an open approach if you can achieve a negative margin. And uh, most patients are going to get adjuvant therapy with radiation. Uh, management of the neck is, uh, is uh, controversial. Uh, we participated in a multi-institutional study looking at the risk of cervical metastases, and you can see it's, it's fairly low, less than 10% for primary metastases, and uh, clearly associated with a higher uh, grade of tumor. So in someone with uh, an N0 neck, low-grade tumor, we would not electively treat the neck. Uh, undoubtedly, there are some patients where we miss uh, disease in the neck, um, and will present with, uh, uh, with later disease, um, and certainly delayed neck recurrence is associated with local failure. So what about neuroendocrine carcinomas? Uh, these are very similar, um, but generally are more aggressive tumors. So how would you manage this tumor? You can see it's invading the orbit, but it looks like there's still a good margin uh, separating the tumor from the extraocular muscles. Would you give preoperative radiochemotherapy or go ahead with surgery? And how aggressive would you be with the surgery for this tumor? Well, I think there are lots of choices here. We would certainly try to preserve the eye as much as possible. And if we can get a margin on the eye, we would do so. 
Um, but I think uh, for these tumors, they are more aggressive, uh, greater risk of regional and distant metastases. So you can make a strong argument for giving upfront uh, radiochemotherapy, especially for an advanced tumor, and then considering salvage surgery. Uh, Sinonasal undifferentiated carcinomas often present with advanced disease. Uh, this one's starting to invade the orbit. What's the preferred treatment for these tumors? And this is also controversial. Uh, I think we, ha we can either do surgery first for a tumor that is operable, or we can do radiochemotherapy first. And the literature doesn't really make a strong case for either approach. You see good results with both treatment strategies. In this patient, we elected to do surgery first, got clear margins with good results, and the patient went on to get radiation therapy. However, a more advanced tumor like this, especially if someone has cervical metastases, uh, which is often the case, we would uh, elect to do radiochemotherapy chemo first with consideration of salvage surgery for any residual disease with, on follow-up. So these are uh, high-grade tumors, often present with advanced disease, and the gold standard really is multimodality therapy. Uh, I think most uh, people would, would favor radiochemotherapy first with surgical salvage. Um, and so there's, there's our treatment strategy, and I think we've evolved over the years. We're more likely to give radiochemotherapy first now for these patients. Uh, adenoid cystic carcinomas are, are uh, quite difficult to manage at the skull base because you never achieve clear resection margins with these tumors. Because of their predilection for perineural invasion, it's very hard to do a complete resection. So how would you treat this tumor? Well, you have lots of choices. Um, you know, I, um, once again, our strategy is to minimize morbidity for the patient, so we would try to preserve the orbit unless there's gross uh, tumor invasion of the orbit. Uh, we don't want to sacrifice cranial nerves uh, if we can avoid it. And so we're trying to get as much tumor removal as possible and then relying on adjunctive therapy to treat the rest. So in this case, you can see we're leaving tumor uh, in the cavernous sinus and Meckel's cave area, and that's going to be treated with the radiation therapy. And so you, I, you know, I think we, we've, early on, back in the days when I was working with Shaker, we were doing on-block resections of the cavernous sinus and, and uh, reconstructing carotid arteries for these tumors. But we quickly realized that that didn't change the, the biologic behavior, the long-term outcome for these patients. So now we've, we're more of a minimalist approach, really just uh, trying to, to get rid of the bulky disease and manage the patients um, with uh, maximal preservation of function. So we can't lose sight of the goals of surgery. Um, but, you know, the, still controversial about the role of radiation therapy. Can this be used as a primary treatment as an alternative to surgery? Um, you know, here's an example of a patient. Uh, this is actually a physician who presented with a, a facial hypesthesia. And here's his adenoid cystic carcinoma, but we never found a, a primary in the mucosa. Um, it was really just filling Meckel's cave. And so we did a gross total resection of that tumor, gave uh, radiation therapy. Unfortunately, he did recur from this tumor. If we look at the literature for radiation therapy, um, there's just some intriguing results with proton beam therapy now, and even as a primary treatment showing very good results. So that may be the next paradigm shift for these tumors. We may be treating more of these patients with radiation up front, even for bulky disease. And I'd, I'd love to hear about your experience here uh, with those tumors. So our approach is really maximal resection with preservation of function and adjunctive radiation therapy. Uh, nasopharyngeal cancer is not something that we see very often in the States. Uh, here's a recurrent squamous cell carcinoma in the nasopharynx. You can see it's, it's quite limited. It's not involving the, the uh, um, posterior fossa or the carotid artery. So how would you treat this tumor? So the endoscopes really have provided an option for management of these tumors, and this is something that we can resect using endoscopic techniques. A bigger tumor, however, with carotid involvement, uh, that's a, you know, a really difficult question to answer. Some of these patients will benefit from very aggressive therapy, um, but many will not. And does it, make, does it make a difference whether it's a primary treatment versus a recurrent? And so you really have uh, sort of anything uh, is an option in these patients. Um, I would argue that these patients generally have very poor prognosis, and even though we have done carotid resections in a few of these patients, some with long-term survival, 
Um, generally, we would not do that at the fir as the first treatment, only for surgical salvage. If they have a good response to radiation, uh, radiochemotherapy, and there's no evidence of distant disease. But it's a heroic operation with uh, great potential morbidity. And then finally, mucosal melanomas, uh, which are always bad. Uh, here's an example uh, of, of a tumor involving the skull base. So how would you, how would you manage this patient? Well, the goal here really is to control the local disease. We may not cure the tumor, uh, but we want to control the local disease for as, for, for as long as possible. So we would offer aggressive surgical therapy in this situation with a good resection followed by radiation therapy. Um, um, these patients are, are certainly at risk for systemic disease and need to be managed uh, very closely by the medical oncologist, and they may be candidate for other systemic therapy. The problem with mucosal melanomas is, is the vast majority of them are going to recur, but this patient has good palliation. They can go for many years in this state. Even with uh, uh, submucosal metastases, they may be asymptomatic, or you can do palliative surgery to manage that, um, and, they're, and they're not having additional morbidity from their surgery. So th these patients sh should all be considered to have uh, systemic disease at time of presentation and be managed as part of a multidisciplinary group Surgery and radiation therapy clearly have a role, but it's primarily just for local control. So now getting back to our original question, who gets endoscopic, who gets open? Um, hopefully I've helped you answer that, that question, but, but once again, it's not just the endoscope, it's not just the technique, it's really considering the whole patient and your relationship with that patient, your own skill level, your own experience. And lastly, I'd just like to talk about the patient who has recurrent disease. We know we're going to fail in a lot of these patients, and this is something we rarely look at. In fact, this is the first study I could find that looked at prognostic indicators for management of first recurrence. So we looked at just at patients with cyanonasal malignancy who had surgery for, for the first recurrence. And we looked at the efficacy of the surgery for that patient. I mean, this is an important economic consideration for patients and certainly important for quality of life. And so we are able to identify 42 patients that met our criteria. And if you look at one year recurrence rate, it's 40%. Uh, you can see that the disease-free interval is better in patients with ethmoid location versus other uh, uh, sites, especially those that involve other areas of the skull base. Um, and if we look at uh, mortality, there's a 30% mortality among these patients. Uh, so you could argue that the 30% of patients who die within one year aren't really benefiting from surgery, and perhaps if we can identify patients who are going to die in a short period, we can offer them palliative therapy. And then if we look at histologic subtypes, you can see a, a big difference in disease-free disease interval. Um, Low-risk tumors such as uh, stesios and adenoid cystic carcinomas have better survival uh, compared to the higher uh, grade histologies. And here you see... Uh, survival differences as well. And then la lastly, we tried to, to measure quality of life. And so we developed this, what we call a hospitalization ratio. And that's how much of your remaining lifetime is spent in the hospital. So if you're spending 34, 35% of your uh, life, remaining life in the hospital, that's probably not a good, for, good quality of life. So that's somebody we'd like to avoid treating uh, ag aggressively. So we looked at patients who died within one year. You can see the hospitalization ratio varied from 18% from to 35%. Um, and so a, a big difference between those who died with less than one year and greater than one year. So based on that, we can now stratify patients into sort of low-risk groups and high-risk groups. So if someone has a recurrence in the sinonasal area, they have a low-risk histology, and they have a favorable... Um, and a favorable location, we would strongly consider surgery for those patients. If they have a high-risk histology um, and, a, and a good location, the ethmoid area, uh, we can still achieve good results. But if they're in other areas of the skull base, especially if they're extending back into the sphenoid or involving the cavernous sinus, we would not offer those patients aggressive surgical therapy. Um, so thank you for being so attentive. I hope that I've, I've uh, stimulated your, your thoughts, and I'd love to hear uh, what you agree and disagree about. Um, also encourage you to attend the North American Skull Base Society meeting. It's going to be in New Orleans uh, next spring. That's always a lot of fun. I noticed that the, the dates were changed this coming year. And also uh, we published a book a few years back uh, 
uh, on skull-based surgery covering both open and endoscopic techniques, uh, uh, has an international uh, authorship, um, I highly recommend it. And finally, we've also established a free educational website for, to really cre create a skull-based community where, where um, uh, healthcare providers of all specialties can get together and discuss the management of patients. Uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I, I'm very grateful to be here.